What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so as we pick up with Exo Man of War, uh, we basically jump into Prelude to Armor Hunters. And this is actually really, really cool. And one of the things that I like about this is it really kind of just like hits home with the uh, traditional fare of Exo Man of War content coming out of Valiant. That's what makes this so cool because, I mean, this is Robert Venditti writing this. And so one thing to keep in mind is that Robert Venditti, he's not the new guy. Like he's, he's not new to comic books. Robert Venditti knows how to write comics. He knows how to write characters and he knows how to tell stories. And the same thing goes with Valiant. I mean, Valiant in the 1990s, it was Marvel DC Valiant. And even right now, in terms of shared continuities, it's Marvel DC Valiant. You know, they're kind of like the top three comic book publishers at the moment. So because of that, what we get with Exo Man of War is a return to familiarity. And what I mean by that is with Valiant as a whole, it's usually like, you know, the world outside your window, that kind of thing. So if one day, you know, if you open your window one day and there was a man flying around in a spacesuit, it would probably be Exo Man of War. <laughs> at least that's the way they try to tell the story. And the cool thing about this is that it takes that very concept that we've seen for the first, you know, 20 some odd issues or something like that, you know, that we've seen so far, and it rolls it over into expanding the mythos. And the reason why is because it's necessary to do that. You know, it's necessary to introduce a character, tell stories that give you an understanding of what that character is about, their rise in terms of power, where they are when they have that power and their fall from power and how they cope with it. After that it is, okay, let's expand that whole thing. And that's one of the cool things about this story is because it follows the Captain America path. You know, when he fought during World War II, he was frozen for 20 years, he was thought out and then led the Avengers. With Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern, he was a Green Lantern for years and years and years. He fell from grace, became a bad guy. He basically died came back to life, or at least that seemed to be the case anyway, he became the Spectre, you know, and that kind of thing. But anyway, went back to being a Green Lantern again. So it's just this cycle of being a hero, having power, falling from being a hero, and then coping with that change. And so what this does is it actually picks up out in space and it deals with the Chinese space station. Now, the other half of this is that, remember, following the events of Unity, it was the formation of a team designed to take down Exo Man of War because of the fact that he himself had intended to invade Romania and restore Visigoth, a country that had long since been destroyed, you know, some one or 1,500, 2,000 years prior. And so because of that, the goal was to basically find a way to subvert him and then bring him under the fold of, you know, the U.S. military. Now, keep in mind, the U.S. military is not doing this because they genuinely want him to have a place to stay, not by any standard of measurement. The military is doing this because they want to weaponize the exo armor. And if they can't duplicate the armor, they might as well have control of the guy who uses it. And so there's kind of a give and take here. You know, exo man of war and his people are freed from captivity and allowed to basically live in their own village. And they're off, you know, they, they well, they're monitored by the military, but they're off limits to virtually everybody else. In exchange, Exo Man of War carries out missions for the US military. And so because of this, the tasking of this group as it monitors him, the military extraterrestrial recon outpost, also known as Miro, actually basically gets wind of a uh, of some kind of an attack or some kind of an incident that took place out here in Chinese astronauts. So with Exo tasked to go and investigate, we basically have some being that resembles Exo Man of War in terms of his armor's appearance, laying waste to all the, you know, this, this entire Chinese space station. Now, again, this is cool because the first question is, well, who is this guy and why does his armor look like Exo's armor? Why does it look like half the armor. And my first thought about this was that maybe he was a failed experiment. Maybe he's a person that tried to utilize the armor before. He didn't pass the, you know, whatever test the armor uses and was only able to use a fraction of it or, you know, some of it bonded to him. He didn't die from the experience. But whatever the case may be, the cool thing about this is that right off the bat, it's casualties. Of course, that's one of the, the great things about Valiant isn't necessarily that they kill people, but they show collateral damage. And that's something you don't really see that often in like Marvel comics. You don't really see an instance where two supervillains are fighting, a building collapses, and like all 200 people in side die. You see that in DC, but you don't really see that too much in Marvel Comics. But the, the offset, the give and take, is that you see a lot more diversity in terms of the different kinds of powers, the different kinds of groups, and so on and so forth. DC th keeps things, you know, relatively close. Marvel makes their groups like, really, the X-Men a lot more prominent, whereas DC's Doom Patrol is more of a niche kind of thing, if that makes any sense. Hopefully I'm not, uh, hopefully that's making sense to you guys. <laughs> but with Exo Man of War here, again, it's really just kind of investigating and figuring out what's going on, but in the fight between himself and this guy, he's basically thrown through this space station and some of the guys are killed when they're sucked out. So again, it's not the most important thing ever, but it does go to show you that Valiant doesn't really shy away from the idea that individuals die as a result of these heroes. Now, Valiant doesn't do this for the sake of just let's show people being killed. They do it because what it does is it creates consequence. It shows you that when superheroes fight supervillains, there's consequence for those actions. 
victims, that people are killed in the crossfire. And that's the big difference here. It's very easy if they were to just show us a building that explodes, it's like, well, man, that building crashed. You don't really see the people inside. You don't see the reaction. And so the connection isn't there. But when you see a guy being sucked out of an airlock in Exo Man of War, Eric trying to hold onto this guy's arm for dear life, only for the arm to be ripped off and the guy to be sucked out due to the pressures of oxygen is escaping the facility, then there's consequence. Then it's like, well, he couldn't save that guy. He tried his best and he couldn't save him. And so again, it's, it's really kind of cool to, to see those scenarios unfold. But the funny thing about this is that this guy that's fighting Exo Man of War is fighting out of desperation, but it almost seems like a legitimate bad guy. The other half of this is he keeps making reference to like individuals who are coming after the armor, individuals who are coming after him, individuals who are looking to capture the armor for themselves. Now, the reason why this is a big deal is because one of the most important things that Robert Venditti has established so far with the exo suit is that it can't be used by just anyone. The exo suit goes through a selection process that people who put it on, if they fail the test, will die. Now, we don't know exactly why they die. We simply just know they're not worthy. They're not deemed worthy by the armor. For whatever reason, Exo Man of War has been deemed worthy and he's able to use it. But this was basically the standard fare for his individual character. With the introduction of these guys who were armor hunters, what it tells us is that where this Exo armor was seemed to be nigh unstoppable and completely overpowered, really, <laughs> it needed a nerf. What's basically being revealed here is there are beings out there who are capable of taking down XO armors. And so again, it really kind of asks the question, who are these guys and where's their power coming from? Now, in terms of the conflict between the two, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty point blank in terms of how they're going against one another. I mean, it's really just the idea that XO is fending off as best he can. This guy has, you know, the ability to regenerate himself whenever he's injured. And so the indication here seems to be that his entire body is impacted by the armor instead of just whatever sections the armor is covering. So it still works for the purpose that it serves, but it also makes this guy a very formidable asset. Asset. And the reason why is because this dude basically says, look, I'm experienced in fighting against other people with the same kind of armor that I have, meaning this individual's fought people who have XO armor. At the same time, he's also skilled in just fighting in general. And so really it kind of provides, uh, you know, Eric with a, with a worthy combatant, a guy who actually gets the better of Eric and is on the verge of killing him. Now, again, the XO armor is just as much a part of Eric as it is a part of itself, meaning the XO armor can operate independently of Eric. And that's exactly what happens here in the sense that when this guy goes to kill, XO, the armor reacts and basically knocks this guy out. Now, again, at this point, we just kind of jump back to Miro. The question being, what was it that XO found? The other half of this is this sets the stage for like armorines. It sets the stage for the actual main armor hunter story because now what's been established here is there's more than one XO suit. And so what this means for the US military is that if there is more than one XO suit, that they can find a way to basically harness the XO suit, that the suit is not contextual strictly to one person, that there is not one suit out there and, and you know, Eric is the only one that has it, it means that anybody can wield it. And so at this point, it's a matter of cracking the code. It's a matter of finding out why it is that some people can use the suit and some people can't. But again, uh, what we end up doing here is we actually jump to a foreign planet uh, called Planet Planet Beck or Planet Bake. I'd love to think that it's Planet Beck because I loved Beck back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome to me, Planet Beck. A Beck where all they do is just play Beck, like a planet where they just play Beck music all the time. That would be amazing. But we basically have a guy who's been killed, a guy who's donning this exo armor, who's been eliminated. So again, this is a pretty formidable group in the sense that they're tracking down individuals who have exo suits and killing them. So again, they're able to overpower the armor, which makes these guys pretty significant. More so than that, some of them, one of them seems to be composed of what seems to be pure energy. Another one's composed of what seems to be a rocky alloy. Again, it's people hailing from different locations, presumably just different races all throughout the cosmos, whether they're artificial or, you know, organic. But what we end up doing is finding out this guy, uh, this, this leader is named Primary. And Primary is essentially traveling across the universe for reasons unknown with the intention of tracking down all these different people who are wielding the XO armor, killing them, and then assuming, you know, presumably taking their suits as trophies. So again, we don't really know exactly what's going on here. This actually gets followed up in the main Armor Hunter story, but it's a pretty cool prelude. I mean, it really sets the stage and asks the question, is Eric the only one who could wield the XO so armor, if he's not, then what potential does humanity have to wield this virtually nigh unstoppable suit that possesses, you know, provides its user with all sorts of powers. But if you guys are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, <laughs> not bad for a two-part story. And I will catch you guys later. Peace.